today's presentation in which I'm going to be talking about the UK housing market. I'm going to discuss why I think the UK is in a massive housing bubble and also why I think that bubble is going to pop in the very near future. I'm also going to give three end game scenarios as to how this could play out. So stick around to the end so you can find out what they are. First and foremost, why do I think the UK is in a massive housing bubble? Well, we know that the average UK house price in 2022 is £280,000. And that is 11.5 times the average salary. The average salary being only £24,600. So that is an astronomical figure. In fact, it is the highest it has ever been on record and it has been for many years. Now, if we look back historically about what the average house price cost in comparison to the average salary, the average over the past 50 years was only 4.2 times the average salary. And you could see it was cyclical. We had houses undervalued when they were around three times the average salary. They were overvalued when they were around five or six times the average salary. And it was like a wave format. But something strange happened here. Houses had become overvalued in the mid 2000s. They were around six times the average salary. And they started to come down and they were supposed to go down to here to revert to the mean as we say but instead something strange happened they went up and up and you can see i put a little rocket ship there to show you just how high they went so what happened here to stop this cycle from reverting to the mean which is what cycles normally do well there was the great financial crisis now, in the great financial crisis, the entire global financial system went into meltdown and it was going to collapse. And what the central banks of the world did was they tried to rush to the rescue and they did that by pump, pumping lots of money into the system. They made it awash with money. It was sloshing around and they also took interest rates down close to 0%. I call this the era of ZERP, which means the era of zero interest rate policy. Now, what was the effect of the central banks doing that? Well, you can see one of them here. It sent asset prices into bubbles. It created asset price bubbles. And this was in the housing market. It was in the stock market. It was in classic cars, fine wines, artworks. Because there was so much money flooding around the system, it found its way into assets. And also, people were able to get cheap credit. Interest rates were close to 0%. This meant the banks were almost giving away money for people to go and speculate. And of course, that all found its way into these asset classes. People were getting second houses, third houses to rent out, to have holiday homes, Airbnb, you name it, people were doing it. And it created massive asset price bubbles. Now, what was the effect on society? Well, it created a wealth effect for people who already owned assets. People who already owned houses or had pensions and stock portfolios, they were seeing gains of 20, 30% a year. All of the central bank money printing was going straight into the assets that they owned. So you can see there's Mr. Moneybags here. He's got his money in his hands. He's very happy. He's been seeing his house go up 20, 30% a year his stock portfolios up, his pension statement that he gets each year shows that it's doing very well and he's very happy. Of course, on the other side of this coin is the young person. This is somebody who came of age around this time, same as me. Now, these people are not able to afford houses anymore. They do not own any assets. All the assets are owned by this generation and the younger generation has been shafted. They cannot afford to buy a house at 11.5 times the average salary unless they take on extraordinary amounts of debt. And they cannot afford a good standard of living because real wages have stagnated and yet the cost of living has gone up and up. So of course, they are very angry. And when they are very angry, they look for ideologies that fit that anger, that tell them why things are this way. And of course, the elites have lots and lots of ideas. They give them all of these radical ideologies, this far left ideology saying that it's because of inequality to do with gender and race and all these other things. And they direct all the young person's anger back onto society rather than on the real culprits of societal inequality, which is the central bankers, the money printers, the governments. So this is a very bad situation because it creates a very disharmonious society. We see lots of 
anger, lots of rioting, people getting more and more radicalised, and that's exactly what's happening right now. It's a form of populism. It's the haves versus the have-nots. Now, let's go to this chart here. So up here, we have inflation. And I want to tell you about how inflation feeds into this. So you can see that in 1970, inflation was very high. We had inflation around 20%. And over the next five decades, inflation lowered and lowered up until the point of 2010, where it went down to close to 0%. It was between 0 and 1%. Now, this was very good for central bankers because when inflation was very low, it meant they could get away with pumping the system with liquidity. They could get banks to give very cheap loans. The problem became apparent in late 2019 when there was a break in the financial system. The repo market spiked. Now, you don't need to understand what that means, but essentially, all of a sudden, all of this kicking the can down the road with money printing stopped working. And unsurprisingly, the following year, we had a crisis. We had the pandemic. And what did central banks do to try and solve it? They pushed lots of money into the system. So they tried to fix the broken financial system again by pumping lots of money into it. Only this time, there was a difference between 2008. In 2008, most of this money was kept on balance sheets. It never entered the real economy. It pumped up assets. It was all, let's say it was digital in effect. This time, the real economy was affected because the money was put into the hands of spenders like you and me. People were being paid just to stay at home, to not leave the house. Businesses were being given lots of money in the form of grants, money that had been loaned from the central bank by the government and then given to the spender to simply stay at home and be unproductive. Now, of course, when you have real money entering the economy, you have more money chasing the same amount of goods or less goods. What do you have? You get inflation. And of course, two years later, we are now seeing massive inflation across the entire world. This is because of the central bank's response to the COVID pandemic. Now, inflation in the UK right now is 7% and the Bank of England projects it's going to be 10% by the end of the year. They also predict we're going to have a recession. I believe we're already in one and actually it's going to be a depression rather than a recession. So now central banks are stuck between a rock and a hard place because the only way they can bring inflation back down is to dramatically raise interest rates. When you raise interest rates, it tightens monetary policy. It means that banks cannot lend so easily and consumers and speculators are no longer able to take out money in the form of loans or debt to buy assets. It essentially pops the asset bubbles because these bubbles are created on a foundation of debt. And the moment you raise interest rates, it means that assets have to deflate in value back towards their real value, not this artificial created one with funny money. But the problem is if you pop the asset bubbles, if you pop the housing market bubble, the stock market bubble, and all of the other ones, what will happen is the global financial system will freeze up and collapse. The reason why is everything is based on these asset bubbles. All of the pensions are invested in the stock market. Everything that the government has to pay back in the form of their debt is based on interest rates. Interest rates go up, it destroys it all. So the central banks are stuck between the rock and a hard place. If interest rates go up, it pops the bubbles, but if they don't raise interest rates, inflation will continue to go up. And where still, if they push more money into the system to reinflate the bubbles, then interest, uh, sorry, inflation will become hyperinflation. So there is a quandary here. What do we do? Well, let's go back to that question. Why do housing bubbles pop? Housing bubbles pop because of a downturn in the economy. Do we have that? Of course we do. Rising interest rates, yes, the Bank of England have rose interest rates to 1%. It's the highest in 12 years, I think it is, and they're only going to continue to increase those rates. And the third reason they pop is a drop in demand. Are we going to see a drop in demand? Of course we are, because if we have a big recession and a depression and interest rates are rising, banks are not going to be lending money. They're going to be risk averse. They're going to say, we're not lending money apart from to their most highest quality of lenders, uh, borrowers, sorry. Obviously, young people who already are feeling the pinch and can't afford a decent quality of life, they're not going to enter the housing market during a downturn in the economy. If they haven't entered it already, they're certainly not going to enter it at that point. 
and there is also going to be increased supply because people who had second houses for speculation or to rent out as an Airbnb, they're going to start to sell assets because the wealth effect is going to start to massively decrease. They're going to be panicked. They're going to try and sell the assets that sell their assets. So there will be a complete drop in demand. Now, that doesn't mean there'll be a drop in desire. There will be, of course, lots of young people who are desperate to get into the housing market to own a house, but they're not going to be able to afford to because the prices will be too high. Getting cheap mortgages is going to be difficult, if not impossible, and there'll be a big downturn in the economy, which will further impact their ability to have enough money to buy assets. So this all together is going to lead to this bubble popping. No matter what, it has to pop somehow. The question is, in what way? And I'm going to discuss three different end game scenarios as to how this bubble may pop itself and how it may resolve in society. So the first one is simply reversion to the mean. So the investing principle is reversion to the mean. That means that over a long enough time period, all assets will, no matter how overpriced or underpriced they become, will revert to the historical average of maybe the past 30, 40 years. Now, if that was to happen in the housing market, it would have to see house prices revert to about 4.2 times the average salary. Now, how is that possible? That would mean that the UK housing market would have to fall significantly. Well, that is possible. It's happened many times in history. In Japan, in the 1990s, they had one of the biggest stock market bubbles and house price bubbles in the history of humankind. And what happened? It popped. And when it popped, house prices in Japan fell by a whopping 60%. So how might we get there in the UK? Well, the average house price today, as we know, is £280,000. If that dropped by 40%, so I'm not talking about the 60% of Japan, a much more modest 40% decline, then you would have average house prices at £168,000. Then if average salaries went up by 50%, and remember, this is in a high inflation environment when salaries have to rise because otherwise people can't afford the basic necessities of life. High inflation means salaries have to rise. So salaries could quite easily rise by 50%. That could be 5% a year over 10 years, could be 10% a year for five years. But if, if, if average salaries rose from 25,000 by 50%, you'd get an average salary of 37,500. Now, if you do the maths on that, a salary of 37,500 versus a house price of 168,000, and that takes you to the average house price being 4.4 times the average salary, which would take us right back down to the historical reversion to the mean. Now, there are other ways it could happen. You could have house prices remain at this level. So because of high inflation, maybe house prices don't go down at all, but maybe they just stagnate. Nobody can afford to buy them at this price and nobody can afford to sell them at this price. So then what would happen? Well, over the next five to 10 years, you could have, again, wages could increase. So the average salary could go up, say, to £50,000 a year over the next decade. And then people would be able to buy houses at this price, but it would only be five times their average salary. So this could also happen. So the price of the houses remains nominally the same, but the value of it decreases because we are in a high inflation environment. So that is how we could revert to the mean. Scenario number two is a hyperinflation. So how could that work? So if these asset bubbles start to deflate as they are now because central banks are raising interest rates, and we're seeing this, remember, already in America, the central bank there, the Federal Reserve, just raised interest rates by half a percent, and immediately the stock market has started to decline. So if this continues and these asset bubbles pop and deflate, the central banks are going to have a global catastrophe because the whole system is built on easy money, on cheap money and debt. So if they increase interest rates, tighten money, it's going to cause a massive fracture in the system and civilization will start to shake. So at that point, the central bank may decide, actually, we've changed our minds. This is not a good idea. And they go back to that money printing. And remember, they're only a second away at all times from clicking that money printer and flooding the system with more funny money. So they could do that. They could re-inflate the bubbles, reverse course on interest rates and flood the system with money. But what would happen? What do you think would happen? Of course, inflation would go through the roof. And if they continue to try and reignite the system this way, eventually you get to hyperinflation. And we're not far off. Remember, 
projected 10% interest at the end of this year. If they do another few rounds of this money printing, it could very easily turn into hyperinflation. So what would happen to uh, house prices in the UK in a hyperinflation? Well, of course, they would go up in value nominally because anything denominated in the hyperinflating currency would increase in value also, at least in terms of the number. Now, this doesn't mean that the value of the house is increasing. It just means that the money supply is being debased and it is impossible to value something in a hyperinflating currency. Nobody would know what the true nominal value of the house was because the currency was so unstable. The only way you'd be able to value a house in that scenario is against something stable, like for example, gold. You could value a house in gold, but not in a hyperinflating currency. Now, during hyperinflations, people who have lots of debt are the winners because what they can do is pay off their static debt. They've got debts that are already fixed and they can pay it off in a hyperinflating currency. And this happened many times throughout history. During hyperinflations, people who had mortgages were able to pay it off with just a month's salary because their salary was hyperinflating along with the currency. But remember, debt remains static, it's fixed. So if you've got fixed debts in a hyperinflation, you come out on top, you get to pay off all your debts for pennies. And this would, of course, help Mr. Wealth Effect again because he's got lots of assets. He may have lots of debt. He may have second houses, third houses that is mortgaged and um, he would come out on top again. But this certainly wouldn't help the young person who has no assets. They would get shafted again. And can you imagine what would happen? Yes, they would be very, very angry. Remember, the last time we had this level of wealth inequality was in the 1930s. That was also the last time we had populism. And where did it lead? Of course, at the end of the 1930s, we had World War II. So we're in the era of populism again, because wealth inequality is the same level and even higher than it was in the 1930s. So a hyperinflation would not help this situation. Remember, Germany suffered a hyperinflation in the build-up to World War II. That was one of the contributing factors. So it certainly wouldn't help social cohesion. The third potential end game is what I call the Great Reset Special. So what do I mean by that? Well, as we know, the fourth industrial revolution, as the elites call it, is well underway and all of our politicians are on board. All of the global leaders, corporations, they're all in on this Great Reset. And part of the Great Reset is this dismantling of liberty, of freedom, of property rights. They don't like property rights because property rights gives you autonomy, self-sufficiency. You can grow your own food in your garden. You don't have to have the state interfere. Remember, England was built on the principle that a man's home is his castle. This was taken by the US when they created their constitution and the idea of liberty. So they're very vested interest in dismantling property rights. And I think we are already seeing that. We're seeing them in their own literature say things about communal living, about returning to shared ownership, uh, about people not owning things personally and that is what they're interested in so they're going to certainly try and indoctrinate the young people into taking on these ideas too so you imagine if we have a global financial crisis and mr wealth effect is wiped out because now all of a sudden his pension's worth nothing or the currency is hyperinflated i think they would use that as the opportunity to install a new form of ownership and it could be communal living or it could be where you have part ownership of a property with the state having the other part. Now, we're actually already seeing that in Australia. Just this past month, the Australian government has come out and said they will take a 40% stake ownership in all new housing, and then they will allow young people to buy the remaining 60%. Now, that sounds like a fantastic scheme, right? You imagine if there's another global crisis where they start trying to tell people you've got to cover your face, you can't leave your house, take this random... Uh, experimental drug. Imagine if you wanted to oppose that and you had the state owning 40% of your house. It's quite foreseeable how they could use that to leverage some situation where you are forced into being obedient. So I think the Great Reset Special, what that really stands for is the state redesigning ownership and private property rights. And I think we're already there and you'll notice it a lot more in the coming years. So how is it most likely that all of this will resolve itself? I think we're going to see a combination of all three. Of course, property prices cannot remain this high. There has to be some reversion to the mean. It is absolutely under, un, unaffordable for young people. And remember, every market has to have two participants, a buyer and a seller. 
Now at the moment we are running out of buyers because they cannot afford to buy. They're actually going another way, they're getting angry and getting angry at the ownership, at the pro prospect of buying or owning things at all. We've got inflation very high and central banks threatening to print more money at all times. And we also have this great reset agenda that's coming. So I think in the coming years, we're going to see a confluence of all three ideas. I'm not exactly sure how it's all going to work out. All I'm doing is looking at their own material and looking at the economic environment that we're in. So it's a very dangerous time to be a speculator in housing, but it's a very good time to be a home owner because you've got that security that you're not going to get wiped out in a coming crash. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Please tell me what you think about my ideas. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for more content like this, and I'll see you in the next video.